we've got the VP of strategy at Adobe, Peter Sheldon. He is one of my favorite speakers and was top of my list immediately for this keynote. So I'm really, really happy to have him. He's going to talk about how tomorrow for e-commerce has come early and make sure you give a big round of applause and welcome for Peter in the chat. Over to you. Great. Great. Thanks, Jamie. Um, hey, everyone. It's uh, it's a pleasure to be back here presenting at uh, Meet Magento UK again. I think it was two years ago that I was there in person. So uh, thrilled that uh, Jamie and the GH team have invited me back. Um, hey, I've done a lot of virtual presentations in my career and um, participated in a number of virtual conferences in the past three months. But I have a confession to make. This is the first one that I've done at 1.30 in the morning. So, hey, you know, I'm, I'm stuck here over on the west coast of, uh, of Canada. Um, unfortunately, traveling to London this year wasn't an option for me or, or for any of us for that matter. Uh, but the, uh, the show must go on. And, and with that in mind, and, and if we think about the, the title of this pitch, um, tomorrow came early. And to uh, en enable that, let's, uh, let's jump into um, uh, the, the DMC DeLorean for a moment. And I'm going to dial in a, a future date into the keypad. I, I think... Uh, if I'm going to do justice to this topic in this presentation, then you know I need to pre propel myself forward to 2024, um, catch up with my old friend, uh, Mr. E-commerce, who appears to have just aged three years in the space of three months. Um, and, and so, if we if we jump into the future and sort of look at what's just what what's just happened, um, listen, you know, you know, COVID-19 has been sort of you know a, an unprecedented event, uh, you know, globally. Um, and I think you know everyone you know wishes that a um, you know this had never happened. And, and B, it would be in a review, review mirror and go away. But the reality is for the e-commerce industry, um, COVID-19 has been an unprecedented accelerator. Um, what effectively has happened, if we look at all of the, the forecasts for how e-commerce is set to grow, you know, we look at you know, firms like Forrester and Gartner and, and, and all of the, the financial analysts and, and sort of look at the, those um, you know, five-year e-commerce growth forecasts that they do, what, 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 what's happened here is we've effectively zoomed forward, got ourselves in the time machine um, and, and, and moved forward uh, you know, three years. So, so where we are uh, today in, in, in June 2020 is where we forecasted we would be in 2024. So so COVID has really just accelerated the inevitable. It's it's accelerated um, the the adoption and growth of digital, um, and and forced in, in many ways consumers' hands to um, you know fully embrace and adopt e-commerce. And, and and in the UK alone, you can see some data here from from Forrester. You know, forty percent of UK consumers agree that they've been spending more shopping online, um, it, you know, the, the, than they than they normally do. Now, you know, it's not just, um, uh, you know, sort of the forecasts, uh, you know, on Wall Street, uh, the NASDAQ has fully recovered to its previous February highs. Uh, in fact, last week, it just broke, uh, you know, an all-time new high. Um, so, you know, uh, digital, um, it, you know, has been sort of thrust into, into the limelight and, and e-commerce stocks have been performing even better than, 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 the, the, than the NASDAQ index. So if we look at, uh, there's a number of different uh, exchange traded funds, ETFs, uh, you know, track the stocks of uh, online retailers and e-commerce pure plays, they're up 38% from the start of the year. Uh, if we look at Wayfair, um, the digital native online furniture store has seen an unprecedented rise in their stock price from a low of $23 in March to a high of $193 this week. I don't know about you, but I, I, I wish I bought some stock in March. I, I didn't. Um, but, but you know, since at the start of the year, Wayfair is up 125%. And Wayfair, like so many digital native online brands, has been able to capitalize and stay fully operational while its offline competitors, the mom and pop furniture stores, the brick and mortar furniture stores, um, you know, were all forced to to, to close down, uh, you, you know, close during during the lockdown, and so. You know, if we look um, um, at sort of, again, going back to forecasts, at Adobe, we, we, we spend a lot of time tracking how, um, you know, Magento merchants, Magento customers, as well as um, sort of the broader group of merchants who use Adobe Analytics to track all of their, uh, you know, behavioral analytics on their e-commerce sites. We, we, we track all of that data and we aggregate it and, and we publish, um, uh, you know, very frequently our, our sort of online retail spend forecasts and predictions. And so we've been monitoring this very, very closely during the uh, during the pandemic. and, and, and so since the start of the pandemic in late February, um, in the US alone, consumers have spent an incremental $52 billion online more than we were forecasting they would. In, in May, 
alone, U.S. consumers spent $82 billion online. That's up 77.8% year over year. And almost every day at the moment for, um, you know, both, you know, retailers globally, not just in the U.S. and in the U.K., um, you know, either every day or many days of the week are effectively peak days. These are days that, you know, in here in May and June, um, they're doing more revenue online than they usually do during their peak days during the, the holiday seasons in November and December. It's funny, I've spoken to, to so many retailers, um, you know, over, over the last few months and, and just, you know, they, they consistently share this story that it's like every, every day is Black Friday, um, you, you know, and, and that's obviously put, you know, unprecedented strains and pressures on their, their operations and their systems, um, but they've made it work. And, and this is, this is and, and I'm going to use this term multiple times in this presentation, so I apologize, but this is, uh, this is the new normal. Now, it's, it's, when we think about, um, you know, e-commerce e growth, um, you know, I think another really interesting trend that we've observed here at Adobe is that, you know, although consumers have been stuck at home, they're, they've not been out and about, not using public transport, you know, not in the office. Um, it, it's interesting that we've actually seen as a proportionate share of, you know, where the devices that consumers are using to, to do all of this, uh, you know, on, on, on online purchases, that actually smartphones are um, becoming sort of the, the favored uh, tool, in fact, as, a, as an overall share of, um, of transactions, you know, smartphones have gained 10%, um, you, you know, year over year in terms of completed e-commerce transactions. And I think what's also really interesting, when we look at, you know, um, sort of the demographic of new shoppers, these are people who previously, you know, either very infrequently or not at all shopped online that have been forced to adopt e-commerce. They're actually um, uh, primarily been using their smartphones. So if we think about, you know, demographics, um, you, know, you, know, you, know, you know, perhaps um, uh, so, so sort of, uh, you know, Gen X, and, and, and some of the sort of older demographics, you know, they, they perhaps don't don't even own a desktop device. The only way that they're able to um, uh, tra transact online is through their smartphones. So this has been certainly, um, you know, a win-win for um, uh, again this uh, progression away from the desktop to to the smartphone. You know, another thing I think is you know really interesting is is um, uh, sort of the adoption of uh, you, you know click and collect or or or, or what we affectionately call in in the U.S. BOPUS. So you, you know with, with stores being shut um, or at least shut to visiting customers, um, the consumers. I think many stores have been operating in in dark mode where they've had a sort of skeleton uh, you, you know staff of of employees still sort of operating, but but they've been operating um, uh, you, you know for 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 buy online pickup in store and. and and most retailers have had to pull what I refer to as their MacGyver moment. You know, they, they had to, um, in, in a matter of, uh, you know, just days, we saw, you know, major US, UK chains, companies like Best Buy in the US have to figure out how to roll out curbside pickup programs and, and allow consumers to buy online, um, drive their car to the car park and, and have a member of staff bring their purchase out to them and, 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 and put it in their boot, uh, doing so in, uh, you know, while observing social distancing. And, and so, you know, BOPIS or what we should probably now call BOPIC um, is, uh, you know, or, or what, what, what we refer to it in, in Britain as click and collect. Um, you know, that's seen 195% year over year, um, uh, you know, uh, adoption, and, and, or I should say growth and adoption uh, in, in May alone. And, and so we can see the growth here of, of you know, BOPIS, you know, starting to flatline. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think these levels are, are going to sort of fall back. Um, you, you know, customers have really sort of, again, have their, their hands forced to try and experience that sort of buy online, uh, you know, pick up curbside, pick up in store. Um, and, and this, again, is part of the uh, part of the new normal now. But that, that said, um, the, you know, uh, many um, uh, uh, oh, uh, missing a. Miss, missing something, something wrong with my slides here, but, but never mind. I'll, I'll, I'll explain. Um, you know, most, most Americans are still, uh, skittish about, um, you know, visiting, uh, stores or malls. And so again, you know, Forrester recently did a, did a survey, um, with, uh, you know, with, with, with US and, and UK consumers asking them about, you know, whether they're ready to return to sort of non-essential places. And, and what you should be seeing here on the screen is a, a chart that, that shows that only 42% of US consumers feel that they are ready to go back to a shopping center, um, you know, store um, as, as they reopen. So, you know, if we think that we're going to see sort of like a, a V-shaped recovery of, uh, you know, the reopening of stores, I really don't think that that's necessarily going to happen. Uh, you know, COVID has definitely caused a permanent shift in consumer, uh, you, you know, um, uh, behaviors, consumer attitudes. Um, and, and again, e-commerce is going to be the big winner, um, for, you know, that the, the, the comes out of this, uh, this pandemic. 
And, and you know, this was, um, I, I, I like to say, you know, we, we, we've sort of accelerated the inevitable. Um, and, and, you know, this was already happening pre-COVID. If we look at brands like Tesla, um, you know, who are, you know, undoubtedly a, a digital disruptor. I think I, I, I talked about Tesla, you know, two years ago when, when, when I was in London. Um, and, and, you know, they'd already figured out that this was happening, not, not COVID, but that there was this, you know, consumer shift, um, that the world around them was changing. And so back in 2000, in 19, you know, Tesla made uh, at the time sort of very controversial decision to stop selling their vehicles in their showrooms. Um, they 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 moved all uh, you know sales to an online only. Um, digital only model. Um, and this is part of their overall sort of experience strategy. Um, you know, their showrooms are just that. They are, they are showrooms, uh, they're experience centers. They are not sales centers. If you want to buy a Tesla in the showroom, you can't, you, you, you can't, well, well, you can, um, but you have to do it yourself. It's a DIY process. You have to pull out your mobile phone, pull up the Tesla website and, and order the car. Um, there's no pushy sales staff who can take your order for you. Um, the staff are brand ambassadors. They help you, they're there to help you fall in love with the brand and the products they're not salespeople and you know again you know um as, as we think forward um you know the new normal is unfortunately the new buzzword uh, rest in peace omnichannel um but but in this in this new normal world th those brands and retailers that have invested in a digital native strategy are the ones who will win um you know 42 percent of americans say they don't plan to return to stores even once restrictions are fully lifted um let's just contemplate that for a moment you, you know while i'm sure that that number will drop as sort of the active covid cases drop it's a chilling statistic for any retailer with a heavy dependence on store revenues. And so those chilling predictions we saw back during the great financial crisis of 2008, you know, those pictures of empty shopping malls with, you know, weeds growing in the car park, you know, they are most likely a reality, at least for many, uh, you know, smaller cities and suburbs. Um, so even for those physical stores that do survive live post COVID, um, you know, things are going to be very, very different. You know, you can see here on the slide, you know, 51% of uh, Americans agree that they'll only return to, um, you know, shopping in physical physical stores, uh, if they're thoroughly cleaned every night, if employees and, and shoppers alike uh, are, are sort of mandated to wear PPE. Um, so, so the result of all of this is consumers have learned that buying online is better, faster, easier, more convenient and safer. Why go back to the store? And, and, and like I said, um, you know, part of this was underway um, already. Like Tesla, Bosley had already seen the writing on the wall. Um, they were the sort of proverbial uh, canary, uh, canary in the coal mine um, back in January before COVID. Um, Bosley announced that they would be shutting all of their stores in North America, Europe, Japan, and Australia. Um, at this time, you know, back in January, that was an unprecedented move for a brand that's relied on these stores for much of its growth and revenue over the past two decades. But as a head of global sales explained, consumers moved on. No one needs to actually try on their noise cancelling headphones or test speakers in a store. They trust the online reviews and content more than they do the sales pitch from an associate. It was time for a radical new idea from Bosey. When we look at some of the, the sort of recent earnings calls from big retailers, um, you know, Zara, like many of us, just announced their Q2 earnings last week. Um, and it's just incredible. Um, so, so Interdex, the parent firm of Zara, um, uh, you know, seen a seismic shift in their business model. E-commerce has been the survival pill du during COVID. Uh, online sales were up, um, 50% year over year in Q2. In April alone, we're up 95%. So Zara have now updated their online sales, uh, growth forecast. Um, you, you know, um, back in 2019, just 14% of revenues came from uh, from digital, from online. Now, by 2022, they expect uh, e-commerce to account for 25% of all the revenues. And as a result of this, they're closing over a thousand of their smaller stores and, and, and downsizing some of their smaller brands. The Canada Goose, the iconic Parker Jacket brand, um, their CFO in their earnings uh, call, you know, recently explained that they would be pivoting to focus more on their direct -to consumer business, both for e-commerce and their own branded experience centers. Um, they intend to reduce their reliance on their wholesale and retail distribution channels going forward. Um, not only do they want to be more in control of their own destiny and their brand, but by pivoting to primarily a direct, direct to consumer model allows them to double revenue and triple profit on a per unit sales basis. So the days of buying a Canada Goose Parker at your local department, department store may well be numbered. 
And then, you know, Lululemon, another iconic brand um, and, and yoga wear pioneer, have also experienced some unprecedented growth um, during COVID. It turns out that yoga has been critical to the physical and mental well-being of its customers during the stay-at-home lockdown. Um, you know, it, 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 there's nothing more comfortable to, to wear around the house than a, than a pair of, uh, you know, Lululemon yoga pants. And so, you know, e-commerce sales are up 125% in April. Uh, Q2 e-commerce sales um, made up 54% of total revenue compared to 26.8% a year ago. So at least um, retrospectively in Q2, Lululemon can now claim to be um, a majority digital brand with e-com revenues uh, exceeding their, their physical store revenues. So this brings me to part two of my presentation. And, and what I want to sort of talk about and focus on is the rise of DNVBs. Um, if you aren't familiar with the term uh, DNVB, then pay attention because you are going to be hearing a lot more about this term going forward. Um, DNVBs are the digital native vertical brands. And let's delve into um, uh, you know, who they are, what they are, and why they're disrupting the retail playbook that has worked for you know, the past 100 years or more. Let's start with um, you know the basics. Um, these firms are digital native. Most of these disruptive brands started life as digital startups, um, you know, on the web or mobile only. Um, many of them, in fact, the vast majority of them, are funded by tech VC firms. So they've taken seed, uh, they've taken angel funding, they've taken uh, you know first round funding from um, uh, you know from 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 the tech VCs, and many of them have already IPO'd on the stock market. Uh, some of them with you know tremendous growth. And even the ones that didn't start out as digital only and came from more of a sort of physical brick and mortar background have now successfully pivoted to be digital first or digital only. A great example would be Bose that we, we already spoke about. Um, they're also vertically integrated, meaning they design, manufacture and sell their own products. These brands are not wholesalers or, or resell of our manufacturers' products. And, and so, you know, there are literally, uh, you know, thousands of these DNVBs. And for the most part, they're all experiencing unprecedented growth. Um, they're disrupting in almost every category from apparel to healthcare to furniture to makeup to groceries. And, you know, these DMVBs, um, you know, don't operate with the, the same constraints as many of their sort of traditional retail peers. Um, you know, direct-to-consumer companies manufacture and ship their own products directly to buyers without relying on traditional stores or middlemen. Um, this allows direct-to-consumer companies to sell their products at a lower cost than traditional consumer brands and to maintain end-to-end -end control over the making, marketing, distribution of their products. Unlike traditional retail competitors, D2C brands can experiment with distribution models from shipping directly to consumers, to partnerships with physical retailers, to opening pop-up shops. They don't need to rely on traditional retail stores for exposure. And, and these well-positioned startups are not just competing with some of the biggest retail brands in the mattress, razor, shoes, and more. They're completely rethinking not just the product, but the retail model and the business model. So let's um, um, switch gears a little bit and, and, and dig in and take uh, a look now at what these uh, DNVBs all have in common. What's the secret to success and why are consumers flocking to this new retail model? And I think the you know the, the first and, and possibly you know almost certainly the most important um, you know trait or, or trend that these uh, you know DNVB firms have is that they are manically obsessed um, on, on 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 customer experience. And I think you know to 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 use sort of case studies here, um, you know one leader that's consistently gained itself sort of top marks for redefining what customer experience means is Glossier, uh, the the direct consumer skincare and beauty brand. And, and there's really sort of five core principles that we can learn from Glossier. You know, first of all, um, it's customer experience, not customer service. It's not about the service that you get as a customer while you're buying the product or, you know, that sort of after sales support you've got once you own the product. It's about the end-to-end -end, uh, customer experience. It's about how you perceive the brand, how you engage with the brand and, and that uh, the experience that you get from that first engagement, you know, through to your, your, your first purchase um, and, and, and that sort of ongoing lifetime um, uh, is, uh, is, um, this uh, sort of uh, relationship that you that you have with the brand. It's also um, important to sort of let your customers um, help you. Um, you know, let your customers be part of the experience. Build a community. Let them have a voice. Let them be part of your team. Um, you, you know, these digital native brands, they, they, they are very community driven, um, much like Magento. I, I think, you know, we, we can learn a lot from sort of, you know, how Magento is driven by its ecosystem and, and, and has this massive community of uh, supporters, followers and advocates. That's exactly the same as why these digital native brands are, are successful. Um, you know, be what you are. Be, be, be 
human. Don't ever lose that. Uh, don't have you, you know scripts or um, sort of you know rigid processes that uh, you know your that your employees have to stick to. Let your employees um, uh, you know do what's right for for their customers and, and treat those customers like your friends. Again, you know the, these firms um, are very very different from traditional. You know, retailers they are they are communities um, they are only as successful uh, as the um, uh, as the advocates that, 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 that they have as customers and, and and as employees you know really they, they, they care about their work they're passionate not just um, about the products that they make but they're passionate about the brand the brand is who they are it's their mission and and I think you know we go back to you know look at firms like Lululemon again you know the the employees that work there um, you know they are all passionate about yoga um, you know, for them, uh, you know, work is play, and 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 that's exactly, I think, uh, you know, a core characteristic that we see from these, uh, you know, these digital native brands. Another thing, and you know, is that um, digital native uh, brands they don't do stores, not in the traditional model. Um, many of them do have uh, what I would call experience centers, so they're focused on creating in, in person experiences, but it's all about. PR. It's all about um, sort of, you know, doing something different, being innovative. It's not about selling products. It's not about, you know, coming to the store to actually buy. You buy online, you buy for e-commerce, but you come to the experience center to be involved in the brand, to engage with other customers, to, you know, meet your peers from the community. And there's some really fascinating examples here. Um, you know, Dyson, uh, you know, just, everyone probably bought an expensive vacuum cleaner over the years. Do you, you know you can now spend $299 on a hairdryer? Um, but, but more so, you can go to a Dyson Experience Center and actually, uh, you know, go and get your hair styled and 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 have a hairstylist show you, you know, why that two hundred ninety nine uh, pound hair dryer is is better than every other hair dryer on the market. At Casper, the 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 the, the, the um, digital disruptive mattress company, um, you, you can go into one of their showrooms and actually take a nap. You can book a little pod, go for a forty five minute nap. I think they charge you uh, twenty bucks for the privilege, but uh, that's a pretty cool kind of differentiated thing to do. Um, Canada Goose, you know, we talked about them already um you want to know if that uh if that parker jacket's going to keep you warm and uh, minus 33 degrees celsius well you can do that in their experience center they have these cold rooms where they'll lock you in and you can see exactly what it would be like to be in the canadian arctic and all birds who just you know have completely disrupted sort of the uh, you know the um, uh, you know the footwear industry. Um, you know when you go into one of their showrooms to try on uh, you know one of their their wool sneakers. Well, you can actually try that on sitting in a, in the same in in, in, a, in a wool sneak, uh, sneaker chair uh, that's using this use made of the same materials that their shoes are. So again, it's all about embracing the experience about you know being part of the being part of the brand. Um, these firms are also socially closer to the consumer. And I think there's no better example of this than, um, you know, what, uh, you know, Calvin McDonald, who's the CEO of Lululemon, talked about um, just uh, just last week in their, in their 2020 um, Q2 earnings call. And, and so there's a couple of things, um, um, you, you know, that's interesting about what they did. Um, you know, you know, first of all, during the early days of the pandemic, um, they launched um, a, a, a new um, uh, online, uh, you, you know, community um, where you know the, all of those um, you know customers who are stuck at home, um, you know, could uh, sort of you know congregate and come together and sort of you know share their stories, um, share their experiences, and, and continue to do uh, you know yoga together in, in in sort of a virtual manner. But also, um, rather than furloughing all of their um, employees and associates from the stores, um, they, they, they fought digital. They said, uh, okay, you know, we know our customers are still want to buy our products. Um, they know that they, that, you know, our customers need our products more than ever during, during COVID. Um, so how can we, um, you know, put our, you know, rather than furloughing our employees, how can we put them to use? So they built a new, um, uh, you know, uh, chat program, their digital educator service. And basically they've, uh, they, they, they've, they've leveraged, uh, you know, FaceTime. I think there's, uh, you can use Zoom. There's multiple platforms and formats that they, um, uh, set up here and basically you online you can book an appointment and and then have a virtual uh, you know video chat at with that same store associate who can advise you, um, you know, on 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 the right, um, you, you know, yoga wear uh, that, that, that that's right for you. So they've really just taken what was happening in the physical store and they've digitized it, which is which is absolutely fantastic to see. 
Um, you know, another thing about these firms is they really focus on sustainability and social responsibility. Um, you know, a great, you know, Magento customer, you know, Eileen Fisher, you know, I love what they're doing here. They've got this, uh, you know, renew program. So you, you can actually, um, you know, when you've, uh, you, you know, finished with one of uh, their, their, you know, their garments rather than leaving it in, in the closet to, you know, for the rest of your life and, and never wearing it again, they actively encourage you to take that back. Um, and they either, you know, recycle it, uh, reuse some of the material, or if it's in great condition, they actually resell it. So, so they have a complete, um, uh, you know, sort of secondhand uh, store where they resell products. And then more and more firms, you know, Tesla is just one example of this, you know, put together full sort of environmental impact reports that they publish annually. They explain to you exactly, you know, where they're investing in sort of the sustainability of their products and their services, everything from, you know, manufacturing, shipping and distribution. So really, really creating that transparency with the consumers about their, um, you know, their social and environmental, uh, you know, responsibilities. You know, another thing that's, um, uh, you, you, you know, sort of, you know, you know, key is is a lot of these um, uh, DMVBs you, you really sort of talk about how their mission is central to their story. So we can see here, uh, you, you know, Honest is such a great example of this. They explain to the customer what their mission statement is, you know, what drives them, why they get up, um, uh, you know, in the morning. And so sort of those internal, you know, typically employee facing mission statements that we, you know, maybe hear the CEO sort of talk about once a year at sort of you know annual annual sales kickoff. Um, those are those are transparent. You know they are the core driving principles, and and you know many of these firms explain uh, this you know to their customers to their buyers. But not only that, you know key and pivotal is explaining their story. How did they come here? And so many of these firms, you know, were started. Um, you, you know, uh, you, you know, but you know by their founders. The founders are still there. They're still running the company. And so sort of explaining that history. Um, you know, how did they come to be? How did they come up with the idea of the brand? How did they build the brand? What are sort of the highs and the lows on that story? And explaining that is, is sort of, you know, really, really key and pivotal. Another thing um, is that, you know, a lot of these firms, you know, really leverage disrupt disruptive business models and primarily it's subscriptions. So whether it's, uh, you know, rent, rent runway where you can, uh, you know, never have to buy that, you know, uh, you know, address again. Um, and, and you can now subscribe to, um, you know, a monthly clothing rental, uh, whether it's Peloton, um, you know, effectively uh, getting into that sort of, uh, you know, home, um, you know, spin class, uh, you know, um, almost a, a cult, um, but, but doing so. For, for less than a gym membership. Uh, if we look at Chewy, the, the US online uh, you know, pet, pet supplies and pet food company, 66% of their revenue comes from auto renew subscriptions. Just, hey, I, I know how much dog food my, you know, my dog eats every, every month and just you know, don't let me think about this. Just, just refill that order. And Carvana, who are a disruptive um, you know, US uh, you know, uh, used car um, uh, platform, you can buy a used car online in under 10 minutes. You can virtually examine it, drive it, and have it delivered to your home. Um, so again, and, you know, these are highly disruptive business models that, uh, you know, change the way we think about, um, you know, buying and doing e-commerce from these brands. Another thing about these these firms is that they use content as a differentiator. If we look at um, you know Emma Weiss, uh, you know the, the 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 founder of Glossy, you know she started it all with a blog into the gloss. That's um, you know that's where you know this all started. And so today, you know they spend a huge amount of time investing in um, original content, not just for the blog, but for for their uh, Instagram uh, uh, channel where they have over two and a half, two point eight million followers and and, and over one hundred and fifty uh, thousand followers on YouTube, where they create a huge amount amount of content explaining, uh, you, you know, how to apply makeup, skincare, best practices, and so forth. So, you know, investing in, in, in original content. Um, they also leverage technology to sort of disrupt experiences. So whether it's Wayfair using augmented reality, where you can virtually see, uh, you know, how that um, uh, furniture will, will, will not just look in your living room, but how it will fit in your living room. Um, whether it's Peloton, who, you know, s originally started with a you know, 300K Kickstarter project, today is worth uh, over $14 billion. And, and, and obviously it's that, that sort of connected um, technology of the, uh, of, 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 of the, f the fitness spin bike and, and, and that ability to uh, actively participate in the class. And another one I love is, is, is Willow, who can, you know, completely, um, you know, redefined, um, uh, you, you know, breast pumping. And, and so, you know, they have an IoT enabled, uh, you know, wearable uh, device that, um, uh, you know, that, that, that allows mothers to, to um, you, you know, go, 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 go through uh, breast pumping completely unt untethered. And, and so, again, you know, they're leveraging technology. There, there's an app that sort of, you know, monitors that. And, 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 and again, you know, very, very disruptive and, and, and widely embraced. Um, 
you, you know, another, I think another thing, and, and this is also, you know, very timely, is that these firms are really focused on diversity. So, um, you, you know, you can see some stats here uh, on, on how especially, you know, female online shoppers, you know, prefer to buy um, from brands that are, you know, founded, led, uh, or run by women, um, how they, um, you know, expect brands to feature a variety of body types and to, um, you know, uh, you know, have, have model photography from, you know, a variety of ethnicities. Um, but also, you know, if we look just in the UK, you know, 50 of the UK's leading direct to consumer brands, um, uh, you know, 32% of them have a female founder just versus just 5% of the, the FTSE 100 companies. So diversity is really, really key to the success of these brands. And then last but not least, um, you know, these brands control their own sourcing and distribution. They are vertically integrated brands. They control everything from, uh, you know, the design of the product um, all the way through the supply chain, whether they're operating their own factories or even when they don't, they have very, very close relationships with their suppliers. So, you know, they set the standards around, um, um, you know, sourcing um, of ethics in, in the factories, working conditions, etc. And, and this really impacts, you know, their ability to have much, much higher gross margins, you know, typically double that of, of traditional e-commerce. And it also allows them to innovate quickly, to get feedback from that community of customers and feed that straight into, in, into the product design to iterate, to come up with new products and to improve the existing products that they have, all based on almost real-time customer feedback. So this is the new normal. Um, it's here to stay. Um, there's no turning back. And, uh, you know, the combination of uh, digitally native to vertical brands and COVID, I think, is, you know, a highly, highly disruptive, uh, you know, factor in our industry. Um, and, and, and despite all the negatives of COVID, um, you know, for, uh, you know, for us in the, in the Adobe Magento e-commerce ecosystem, um, you, you know, although they're, you know, not, not everyone has, uh, not every, uh, you know, company has necessarily sort of, you know, seen growth. And, and there's certainly been companies that have been very negatively impacted for the most part. As we come out of COVID, um, you know, e-commerce is one of the uh, is going to be one of the beneficiaries and and, and, and winners. So with that, um, I think it's time for me to jump back in the delirium. I'm kind of done with 2020. I don't know about the rest of you. Um, so I'm going to dial it up and uh, you know jump jump forward to um, uh, 2021. So um, you know, hopefully uh, by 2021, you know, COVID will be in the rearview mirror. Um, we can all meet again, shake hands, and have a drink in person for uh, for Meet Magento 2021 in London. So. Uh, so see you all then and uh, Jamie back to you wow thank you Peter that was that talk was brilliant that's exactly you know I put it on the list and I say that's what I dream for at the start of a conference I think you just knocked it out of the park there I, I think I can re-watch that talk five times and I have five completely different set of notes of new things that you said there uh, I also think the Adobe marketing department just had 15 new white papers. That was just unbelievable amount of content there. Uh, so thank you again. Thank you, especially for two o'clock in the morning. It must be now uh, coming in and, uh, and talking for us. Uh, so for the audience, I see a lot of activity in the chat, a lot of activity on social as well, which is amazing. Uh, over a hundred people have registered for the event during the keynotes. They must have heard how good Peter's talk was and rushed to try and see the end of it. Uh, so we're trying to keep up with that demand. There is some work involved there. So if you're coming in late, I apologize, but um, it's the way it is. Uh, instructions for everybody now, head over to the sessions tab on the left to choose your next talk. They're all great. So choose the one that's for you. We will have recordings post event available for any talks you've missed. If we've done our job right, the decision's going to be hard for every single one of those talks today. And you'll be able to watch the recordings later on. So goodbye from me. Welcome again to Meet Regenta UK. Thank you again, Peter. And I hope everybody has a great day. I'll see you all later. Goodbye.